Welcome back, everyone. Um, for our last lecture for the semester, we're going to talk about a topic which we uh, run into before in the context of Newton's laws, uh, that of equilibrium. Um, but we're going to look at it in the context of now where we can add the effects or the, the, the concepts of solid body rotation uh, to talk about things that not only aren't translating or um, are, um, uh, a, you know, not, not, moving, uh, not moving around uh, left, right, up, and down, but also aren't tipping over in various senses, what we would generally call static equilibrium. Um, so when the net forces on any object aren't in, or are in balance, um, then there will be no acceleration for that object, and its momentum will be constant. Um, and similarly, if the net torques acting on an object are uh, constant, then that object won't undergo any changes in its angular momentum. Um, and if both of those are constant, both the linear and the angular momentum, and they are um, at rest, they're not moving, then we have a static equilibrium condition. And this is the sort of thing that you typically want for things like buildings and bridges and so on, that they are uh, in balance in such a way that they're not going to move um, under their use. <coughs> now, there are different kinds of equilibrium, um, and we can sort of rank these equilibrium uh, conditions by whether or not, um, or by how the, the system will respond if you push it slightly out of equilibrium. So, for instance, if you have a uh, sort of a marble in a depression like this, then the equilibrium position will be the lowest point in that depression. But if you push it out of equilibrium, then it will naturally want to roll back to the equilibrium position. And so we would call this a stable equilibrium. And again, for things like buildings and bridges, etc., you tend to want to have those as a stable equilibrium. Because uh, the other option is that you have an unstable equilibrium. Again, if you stick a marble on the top of this concave down uh, structure and push it a little bit out of the equilibrium position, then it's going to run away. And so unstable equilibrium is characterized by uh, if you push it out of equilibrium, it will run away. So for instance, if I try and balance the pen on its tip, I could probably, if I was careful enough, find an unstable equilibrium condition, but the slightest little wiggle of the desk or the air in the room would still knock it over. This would be an unstable equilibrium, whereas if I'm holding the pen by its tip and I push it out of equilibrium, then it comes back to the equilibrium position push it out of equilibrium, and it comes back. So holding the pen by, its, by the tip up here is a stable equilibrium, but trying to hold the pen, support the pen from below, is an unstable equilibrium. There's a third option, which is um, if you have a neutral equilibrium, then when you push the object out of its equilibrium position, it will find another equivalent equilibrium position to settle down into, so a ball on a flat surface or something like that. Closely related to this concept of equilibrium is this idea of balance. Um, and uh, balance is uh, characterized by the relationship between an object's center of mass and the what they call the base of support or uh, sort of the widest spread of support for uh, that object. And as long as 
the center of mass is sort of between the extremes of the base of support, um, then the object will, uh, will balance or will be stable, right? So a car with a low center of gravity, uh, where the mass is not uh, high up but cent centered down low, is harder to roll over. Um, but if you get the center of mass above its pivot point, that's sort of the critical balance point. Over here, the force of gravity is going to try and push the car back down onto the road. Here, we're sort of on the knife edge, and if you let the center of mass of the car get outside of its base of support, then gravity is going to pull on it out here. Gravity pulls on the object from its center of gravity, from its center of mass. Um, so, for instance, this dancer, wants to balance on the tip of her toe, must arrange the rest of her body so that her center of mass is directly above the one point where she's um, uh, being supported. In this case, this is not an easy position to stay, to stay in. This would be an unstable equilibrium, and the only way the dancer is able to maintain that is by constantly adjusting, uh, shifting her weight to make the center of make her center of mass stay directly over that point. So we could look at this diagram, for instance. So in each of these diagrams, the center of mass of the box is represented by the dot. Obviously, this is not a uniform density box. It's heavier on the end with the dot than on the end uh, without the dot. Uh, and if we think about where this box is going to t rotate around, if we look at its um, uh, at, at these diagrams, it's clear that if it rotates, it will rotate around its lowest corner, okay? And so its base of support here would be from here to there, and we can see here for box A, the center of mass is between its base of support. Another way of looking at that is that the force is, the force would be downward, from this point, and our axis would be over here, and so the torque would be a twisting clockwise motion for box A around this axis. Um, box B is also ha has a center of mass between its base of support, and again, the if we have our radius direction from our axis that way, and our force downward, then the cross product of that is going to again give us a counter a clockwise twisting motion, which will tend to, or which will tend to keep this box pushed down onto the ramp. Again, with D, the same thing. The base of support is narrower, but, the the center of mass is just barely in this case between the or near, uh, on or inside the base of support, and again the torque would be clockwise, but over here the center of mass is outside the base of support, which means that the torque, the downward force applied at an angle up and to the right that's going to give us a counterclockwise twisting motion. And so the, uh, this box here will tend to fall over. So this box C is the one that would fall over. The others are all at least modestly stable and balanced. Um, so with this idea, we could approach a problem like this, where we're trying to balance blocks at the edge of a table. It says if you put a uniform block at the edge of a table, the center of the block must be over the table not to fall off. In other words, the center of mass of the block um, must be uh, supported from below. Its base of support must go out to be under the center of mass. 
Um, so for one block, here's our block. The center of mass of a uniform block is going to be in the middle of the block. A distance L over 2 from the end, if the block is of length L. And if we want this block to be balanced on the edge of a table, then it must be that at most the center of mass can be at the edge of the table. And so only a distance of L over 2 over here could overhang the edge of a table. Now, if we stack two blocks at the edge of the table, right, so a two block case, well now we have to calculate where the center of mass is for the two blocks. Well, the top block has its center of mass there. And if it's going to balance on the bottom block, then it must be that the bottom block at most must have its outer edge underneath the center of mass of the top block. And so again, this distance is L over 2, and this distance here, another L over 2, and that's where the center of mass of the second block is. Clearly the center of mass of these two blocks is going to be somewhere in the middle, so we can't just put the edge of the table right here, but we're going to have to calculate where the center of mass is. So let's do that. The center of mass in this case well, that's the sum over the x, we, and we really only care about the horizontal position of the center of mass. So the horizontal position of the center of mass, that's going to be, uh, if we're going to count from the edge of the block here, then block 1 is a mass at a distance of L over 2, and block 2 is another mass, but this one's at a distance of, well, L over 2 plus L over 2, or L, and there's a total of two masses. So the masses all cancel. And the center of mass position here is L over 4 plus L over 2, or 3 fourths L. We could probably have guessed that just from symmetry, that the, or the center of mass here would be halfway between those two. And so if we want then to balance it at the edge of a table, then we would have to put the table's edge here uh, under the center of mass, which means that our overhang is L over 2 plus another quarter L over 2, or another quarter L, so the overhang in this case is um, 3 fourths L, whereas over here the overhang was 1 half L. Okay, well what about three blocks? Well, three blocks, we make three blocks by sticking our two blocks on top of a third block. Um, we know how our two blocks have to be arranged, and the third block would have to go right here so that its edge was just where the table edge was. So for three blocks, we're going to have a configuration uh, like so. So there's the bottom block. And its edge must be sticking right here at this point so that three quarters of the second block, the middle block there, is sitting on top of the bottom block. So 
If this is, again, our zero point, this distance here is going to be L over 4. And then our third block is going to be, again, out here. Um, where this distance here is L over 2. And so the position here, again, we have to find the center of mass. We have a mass, this top block's mass, is at a position of, well, from the, this edge, it's um, a quarter out to this, to the edge of this block, plus from this block to this block a whole length, so that's at 5 over 4 times the length of a block. The second mass is L over 2 plus L over 4 is at 3 fourths L out, and the third mass is just half a block out. And now there's three masses, so again the masses cancel. Our center of mass now is going to be, let's 5 over 12 L plus 3 over 12 L. Um, that's going to be uh, 1 over 6, or 2 over 12 L. So 5 plus 3, that's 8, plus 2 is 10. That's 10 twelfths L, or uh, 5 sixths L. So 1 sixth of this bottom block is where our center of mass is, and our overhang is now L over 2 plus L over 4 plus L over 6. L over 2 plus L over 4 plus L over 6, or that's, let's see, 2, 4, and 6. Those are going to have the common denominator of 12. So that's 6 over 12 plus uh, 3 over 12 uh, plus 2 over 12 times L. Uh, 6 plus 3, 9, 11 twelfths L. And we could keep going. Eventually, we would be able to um, walk the edge of the blocks out so that you could even hang an entire block um, off the edge. The overhang can eventually get large and larger uh, than a block. Um, and you could work out, there's a sequence here uh, in the overhangs, you could work out basically what the most the, the, the steepest shape would look like and so on and, and how rapidly um, or how large the overhang would be for progressive uh, layers if you want. But the takeaway here is that um, the balance point is always going to be at the center of mass of this system. So another application uh, of the idea of center of mass. All right, so in general, this concept of uh, static equilibrium is going to be one where um, we have not only that the forces are in balance, right? This is, this is the condition that we are already used to seeing, that the sum of all the forces has to add up to zero if our system is going to be in equilibrium, otherwise the system would accelerate. And, in, and remember that this sum of forces is a vector sum of forces, so the horizontal components of force must be in balance. The vertical components of force must separately be in balance. So you'll get actually usually two equations 
uh, of force balance or often get two equations of force balance uh, just from that. But if we don't want our object to rotate either, then there's an extra condition that we can apply, which is that the sum of the torques acting on that system must also be zero. Um, and from that, uh, we get a third constraint. Um, these all must be true for the, uh, the, the, um, all of the coordinates uh, independent of one another. Typically, you're going to have, uh, in most of the physics, or most of the problems you're likely to run into, in this class at least, um, only one torque balance equation to worry about. Um, and uh, sometimes two force balance equations, sometimes just one force balance equation if all the forces are vertical, for instance, or something like that. Um, so let's try an example, or a couple of examples, and see how to put this system to work. So for instance, this is a relatively simple one. We could guess the answer. How much of the weight of the ladder does each worker hold up? So let's assume that the ladder is being held horizontally, that the ladder is uniform so that its center of mass is just in the middle of the ladder. Our intuitive expe expectation is that each of the workers is holding up half the ladder, but let's see if we can prove that. So we'll draw ourselves a picture. Here's the ladder. Okay, and right in the middle of the ladder is where the weight of the ladder will be applied. So there's the mass of the ladder times gravity pointing downward. And then there are two upward directed forces uh, of the workers pushing the ladder upward. So let's call this one force one and that one force two. Um, and from the sum of forces, we know that um, uh, the upward directed forces, so F1 plus F2, minus the downward directed force, weight of the ladder, that must be zero if the ladder isn't going to accelerate. And from this, we can then conclude that F1 plus F2 is equal to the weight of the ladder. All right, so intuit pretty intuitively, the sum of the two forces from the workers must counteract the weight of the ladder. So between the two of them, they hold up 100% of the ladder. All right, that's sort of obvious. Um, but we also have this torque balance equation. Um, and we're going to go with the con convention that um, counterclockwise torques are positive and clockwise torques are negative. Um, and we have to choose an axis. Now, the torque through any, the force point or pushing through any axis produces zero torque because remember the the uh, the torque is the magnitude or the the it's r cross f so it's the magnitude of r times the magnitude of f times the sine of the angle between those two well if the distance is zero then the torque is zero. So any, any axis that we choose um, will uh, give us zero torque uh, through any force that runs through that axis. Now, we're free to choose the axis of rotation here. Um, because we want it to not rotate. And if it's not going to rotate, it's not going to rotate over ever, around every possible axis. For ease and convenience, I guess let's just choose our axis to be the rear worker. Not that it particularly matters in this case. There isn't a, a, uh, a choice of axis that makes this problem easier. All right, well... 
the counterclockwise torques, right, so there's three forces. F1 isn't going to produce any torque at all because it's going through that axis. F2 is going to produce a R crossed into F counterclockwise torque, whereas the weight R crossed into F is going to produce a clockwise torque. And so our sum of torques here would be um, if this is our distance L, uh, L times uh, F2, that's a positive torque, minus L over 2 times mass of the ladder times gravity, that's our negative torque, our clockwise torque. That's also got to be 0, so that L times F2 has to be L over 2 times mass of the ladder times gravity, and we can cancel the length of the ladder and see that force 2 must be 1 half of the weight of the ladder, and then plugging that back up there we would see that force 1 plus mlg over 2, the weight of, half the weight of the ladder must equal mlg the weight of the ladder, so that force 1 must also equal half the weight of the ladder. And so yes, what we've proven here is that F1 equals F2 equals one half of the weight of the ladder, the intuitive answer. But now we've proven it. And more to the point, we can ask a second question, which is how much uh, does each worker, how much of the weight of the cat does each worker support? And this is less intuitive and less immediately obvious. Um, we have essentially the same diagram here still. We've still got our ladder. It still has um, its weight felt from the middle, but to this we've added a cat whose weight is pointing five er, pointing down five sixths of the way along the ladder, um, and we still have F2 going up over there and F1 going up over there. So we still have the sum of vertical forces has to sum up to zero, so F1 plus F2 minus mass of the ladder times gravity minus the mass of the cat times gravity must equal zero. Or again, the sum of F1 and F2 has to be mass of the ladder plus the mass of the cat times gravity. In other words, again, between them they have to conspire to hold up both the cat and the ladder. We could have guessed that. But we also have that the sum of torques must be zero. And again, if we choose as our axis that back point there, then F1 produces no torque. F2 still produces a positive torque. Um, uh, but, F, or, but the two weights will produce negative torques. And so uh, F2 at a, length, a distance L from the axis minus um, the weight of the ladder at a distance L over 2 and minus um, the weight of the cat at a distance 5 sixths L. That also has to equal 0. And so um, F2 uh, times length L must be um, mass of the ladder plus the or mass of the ladder over 2 plus the mass of the cat um, let's write this again let's just 
take fewer steps here. So this is mass of the ladder times gravity times L over 2 plus mass of the cat times gravity times 5 L over 6. Um, and we can cancel out the L's here and F2 must be half the weight of the ladder plus five-sixths the weight of the cat, which if we then combine up there, it's pretty easy to prove that um, F1, which is mass of the ladder times gravity plus mass of the cat times gravity minus half the mass of the ladder and minus five-sixths of the mass of the cat, or weight of the cat, that F1 will be holding up half of the weight of the ladder and one-sixth of the weight of the cat. So, the, uh, the cat is divided five to one um, between the front and the rear worker. Uh, obviously, the closer the cat is to the front worker, the more of the weight of the cat the front worker has to support. All right, let's try a different, another example here. All right, so it says, Sir Lancelot rides slowly out of the castle at Camelot and on to a 12-meter-long drawbridge that passes over the moat. Unbeknownst to him, his enemies have partially severed the vertical cable, holding up the front end of the bridge so that it will break under a tension of 5,800 newtons. The bridge has a mass of 2,000 or 200 kilograms, and its center of gravity is at its center. Lancelot, his lance, his armor, and his horse together have a combined mass of 600 kilograms. Will the cable break before Lancelot reaches the end of the drawbridge? And if so, how far from the castle end of the bridge will the center of gravity of the horse plus rider be when the cable breaks? All right, so let's pull a, piece, a few facts out of here. The maximum tension that that uh, rope can take was uh, 5,800 newtons. The mass of the bridge is 200 kilograms. And the mass of Lancelot here is 600 kilograms. Uh, the length of the bridge is um, 12 meters. Um, and we can draw our bridge here. So the mass of the bridge times gravity goes down from the middle. There's a tension force out here somewhere a distance x is Lancelot and Lancelot's weight shows up at that distance x. Um, we could look at this and go, all right, well, There must be at least one other force here. Um, the bridge is being held up over here also by some force through the hinge. Um, so if we wanted to add up, for instance, the sum of vertical forces, which must sum to zero, well, then that's going to be the hinge force, whatever it is, um, plus the tension force, 
minus the weight of the bridge and minus the weight of Lancelot, that must be zero. Okay. Um, but we don't know much about that hinge force. On the other hand, if we choose that to be our rotation axis, then the hinge force doesn't matter for the torque equation. So we could say the sum of torques also has to equal zero. There is no torque from the hinge force. Um, the tension will produce a counterclockwise torque. Um, so that's uh, torque at our distance um, L. Um, and the bridge is going to produce a clockwise torque, so negative torque, and that's the weight of the bridge at a distance L over 2. And Lancelot will likewise produce a clockwise torque, so that's a, the weight of Lancelot at whatever distance x Lancelot is at. And that also has to be zero if our bridge isn't going to tip over. So let's go ahead and set t equal to t max, solve for the position that would give us the maximum tension, and if this position is less than 12 meters, then Lancelot's going to go for a swim. All right, so uh, if we then say that L times T max um, must equal uh, L times T max minus the mass of the bridge times gravity times L over 2. Um, minus uh, the mass of Lancelot times gravity times x, that must be zero, and we're solving for x, so L T max uh, minus the mass of the bridge times gravity times L over 2 is equal to um, the mass of Lancelot times gravity times x, or that x is equal to L times T max minus mass of the bridge, gravity of the bridge over 2, so minus half the weight of the bridge, and then divided by mass of Lancelot times gravity. So that's 12 meters and we said 5800 newtons is T max minus 9.8 meters per second squared times 200 kilograms over 2 divided by um, <coughs> uh, 9.8 meters per second squared times 600 kilograms. So uh, 9.8 times 200 divided by 2 980, 5800 minus that 980 is 4820. Um, multiply by 12, and divide by 9.8, and divide by 600, and we find that Lancelot uh, gets out to um, 9.8 meters from the bridge, but then the tension is larger, then the tension equals its maximum tension as, as he makes another step. Uh, he'll go in the drink, so he's not going to be able to make it all 12 meters across the bridge. All right, for one final example, We'll do one that's a little bit more involved and doesn't entail 
just right angles at one another. So it says a uniform ladder of five meter or five meters long rests against a frictionless vertical wall with its lower end three meters from the wall. Okay, so we've got a five meter ladder leaning against a wall like so, so that it's five meters long and three meters out from the wall. So this is a three, four, five triangle um, from uh, geometry. All right, uh, the ladder weighs 160 newtons. So the weight of the ladder is 160 newtons. The coefficient of static friction between the foot of the ladder and the ground is 0.40. All right, so some static friction, 0.4. A man weighing 740 newtons climbs slowly up the ladder. So weight of the man is 740 newtons. All right, so let's look at the forces acting on the ladder. So here's our ladder. Woof, that was a very wonky looking ladder. All right. There's our ladder. All right. Now, what forces are acting on the ladder? Well, there's the weight of the ladder, which is going to be acting from the middle of the ladder. Okay. And then where, there's the weight of the man at some distance from the foot of the ladder. Okay. Um, there's a normal force from the floor. There's also a normal force from the wall. So let's call that N sub w. And then finally, there's a static friction force, which must be pushing towards the wall because the ladder wants to slide down the wall. So there's a static friction force uh, to the right. All right. Um, the sum of vertical forces must be zero. So let's add up all the vertical forces. That's uh, the normal force from the floor minus the weight of the ladder and minus the weight of the man. That must be zero. So that the normal force from the floor must be the same as the magnitude of the weight of the ladder and the man combined. Okay. And indeed, we could even calculate that. That's uh, 160 newtons for the ladder plus 740 newtons from the man, 160 plus 740, 900 newtons. Uh, force from the floor on the ladder. Um, <coughs> we can't say what the normal force on the wall is, um, except that the normal force on the wall uh, must be the opposite of the static friction force. Um, if the ladder isn't going to move horizontally. Um, the static friction force is going to be whatever it has to be to balance the normal force of the wall, um, or its maximum amount of static friction, the maximum amount of static friction, um, would be the normal force from the floor times our static friction coefficient. So that would be 
0.4 times 900 newtons or 360 newtons. That's the maximum amount of static friction uh, that our ladder could uh, feel. What is the actual frictional force when the man has climbed one meter along the ladder? All right, well, how are we going to calculate that? Well, here's where we need to do then the torque calculation, right? Because this, this came from the horizontal force balance, and this came from the vertical force balance. Um, the torque balance, well, let's look. There's one, two, three, four, five different forces acting on this ladder, but two of them are acting through the foot of the ladder. So if we put our axis of rotation at the foot of the ladder, then that means we only have to calculate three torques, not four or five torques. So let's do that. And we have to say that the sum of the torques is going to be zero. All right, well, this is where we have to do a little bit of dealing with these angles. So let's look up here. Oops, sorry. Let's look up here at the top of the ladder. So the radial vector will be that direction, and the force vector is this direction. So we want to know what this angle is. Well, if this is our, the interior angle of our 3, 4, 5 triangle, we'll call that the angle theta. This also must be that angle theta, which means that this is 90 minus theta. And this is a right angle of 90 degrees. So this angle here is 90 plus 90 minus theta, or 180 minus theta. And so the torque up there from the wall is going to be um, our distance, L, um, uh, or in this case, 5 meters, um, times the, uh, the normal force from the wall, whatever that is, um, times the sine of this angle of 180 minus theta. And that's going to be a twisting force uh, that is counterclockwise. So this is going to be a positive torque. Careful. Now, sine of 180 minus an angle, um, sine of 180 minus uh, theta. If you go look up your, uh, your uh, properties of the sine, this is also equal to the sine of theta. And in this case, sine of theta, if this is a 3, 4, 5 triangle, sine would be 4 over 5 opposite over hypotenuse. So um, this is 5 meters times the normal force of the wall times 4 fifths, or the torque from the wall is um, 4 meters times the magnitude of the normal force from the wall. All right. That's one of our torques figured out. Um, the second torque we're going to have to look at is the weight of the ladder, which happens at a distance of two and a half meters 
from the angle in, into the from our anchor point from our our rotation axis, and there's our angle theta. And now we're looking for that angle. Well, that's going to be 180. Well, this angle here, that's 90 minus theta, and this angle is going to be 180 minus 90 minus theta, or that's going to be 90 plus theta. And so the sine of 90 plus theta, again, if you go look up uh, properties of the sine, um, is the cosine of theta. And in this case, the cosine of theta, we still have a 3, 4, 5 triangle, so that's adjacent over hypotenuse. That's 3 fifths. And so the torque due to the latter, well, it's going to produce a clockwise or negative torque. That's minus uh, the weight of the ladder times two and a half meters times three over five. And the weight of the ladder was 160 newtons. So that's minus 160 newtons times 2.5 meters times 3 over 5, so 160 times 2.5 times 3 divided by 5. This is minus 240 newton meters. That's the torque caused by the ladder. The torque caused by the man is very similar. Uh, we can see that the man's weight is also going straight down and the angles there will play out similarly. So the torque due to the man is also going to be minus uh, the weight of the man in this case. The distance, it says, well, we've let the man climb a distance of one meter along the ladder. So one meter and uh, again, three fifths is the sine of this angle here, that angle there. Um, so that's minus, the weight of the man was 740 newtons times one meter times three fifths. So 740 times one times three divided by five minus 444 newton meters. And so uh, our torque balance equation then is going to be that four meters times the normal force from the wall minus uh, 240 newton meters minus 444 newton meters must be zero, or that four meters times the normal force from the wall must be um, the 240 newton meters plus 444 newton meters, which is uh, 684 uh, newton meters. And if we divide by four, that gives us that the normal force from the wall is 171 newtons. And since we know that the normal force from the wall must also be the friction force, that means that the static friction force at that point is also 171 newtons. Final part of the question asks, how far up the ladder can the man climb before the ladder starts to slip? So we have essentially that same relationship, except that now the torque due to the man is just going to be minus the weight of the man times some unknown distance times three fifths. 
and the torque due to the wall, that's now going to be our maximum amount of static friction, 360 newtons, at a distance of 5 meters, um, uh, times again that same sine of 180 minus theta, or 4 fifths. So that's going to be 360 times 5 times 4 divided by 5, 1440 newton meters is the torque due to the wall. And so now our torque balance equation would look like this, that the torque from the wall minus, uh, or the torque from the wall, which was our 1440 newton meters. Let's actually do this on a new page here. So our torque from the wall, the 1440 newton meters minus the torque from the ladder, right, which was still the same as it was before, so minus the 240 newton meters from the torque of the ladder, um, and then uh, minus the weight of the man at a distance d times 3 fifths, that now has to equal zero. So 1440 minus 240 gives us 1200 newton meters over here on the left. And if we move this term over to the right, uh, three fifths, the weight of the man was um, uh, 740 newtons. And the unknown position D. So um, our distance d would be 1200 newton meters uh, divided by 740 newtons n times 5 over 3. So 1200 times 5 divided by 3 divided by 740. Our man gets a distance 2.7 meters up the ladder before the ladder starts to slide. So, um, the way to deal with these uh, static equilibrium problems in general is uh, to uh, use the same technique we were using with forces, that we balance the vertical and horizontal forces separately, but to that we can add a third constraint, which is that the sum of the torques must also add up to zero. Um, be careful with the angles when calculating the torques, um, be careful with the directions when calculating the torques, but other than that, um, it's just a little bit more algebra for these rotational uh, static equilibrium problems than it is for the, uh, the standard translational ones. All right, well that's it. That's all we're going to cover uh, this semester. Our exam is on Friday, uh, May the 1st, um, and we'll cover uh, the entire course from uh, one-dimensional kinematics all the way up uh, until static equilibrium. Um, uh, remember that you also have the online homeworks, which count as extra credit towards your grade. Um, I will be uh, taking those, I will be taking the grades from those on Saturday, so um, by Friday evening finish up your, uh, any work that you haven't finished up on those, and I will add those uh, to your grade. Other than that, it has been my pleasure to uh, be your uh, tour guide through physics this semester. Uh, as crazy as this semester has been, uh, and I wish you all well on your exams.